So it's a thrill to have Ken Sandy as our guest today. Our next forum will be November 4th. We have Todd Billings, and we'll be talking about his book, Rejoicing and Lament, Wrestling with Incurable Cancer and Life in Christ. But let me tell you a little bit about Ken. Ken was the founder of Peacemakers Ministry and of Relational Wisdom 360. He was trained as a mechanical engineer, worked in medical research and development. He also got a degree in law, and then God had other plans for his life. After graduate school, about a year afterwards, he was called to biblical peacemaking and founded a conciliation ministry in the state of Montana. He worked at that, which grew into Peacemakers, for about 30 years. In 2011, he founded a new ministry built on that, sort of a follow-through, uh, called RW360, and uh, God is using him in remarkable ways. He's here with his wife, Corlette. They've been married 27 years. Uh, Ken authored the book, Peacemakers, which many of you have read. His wife authored the Young Peacemakers curriculum as well. They have two children, a captivating grandson, and the smartest dog in the world. So will you welcome Ken Sandy? So Ken, thank you for being with us. You're welcome. The smartest dog in the world. Yep. Whoop. Whoa, that's all right. Um, can your dog sing? Can't sing. My dog can sing. Oh, well. <laughs> but my dog's not that smart, so we'll... <laughs> we'll uh, well, we're here to talk about uh, relational wisdom, and you've had this amazing, unexpected journey. I mean, from engineer, lawyer, to all the ministry things you've done. Did you, did you ever imagine you'd be doing this? Not at all, no. But I, I can look back and see God's training, or his purpose in it. Uh, when I left engineering and law to go into ministry, I thought, well, I'd sort of wasted that time. But actually, as a peacemaker, as a conflict resolver, I realized that my engineering training, and engineers are trained to solve problems. And so people would come with, with issues and complicated situations. And what I learned as an engineer was to take a complicated problem, break it into component pieces, apply the proper laws, and never violate the laws. Yeah. And that's what peacemaking is. So even God's training back in engineering prepared me to be a peacemaker. Well, and that's what I said uh, when we had lunch a little while ago. That, that is a gift he's given to you because you've been able to take these principles from Scripture and break them down and make them very teachable, understandable for simple minds like mine. So, and <laughs> as a pastor of a church, just for children, young people, I've watched it happen. Uh, you, you say on your website you've been twice privileged. Uh, you've had the opportunity to lead two great ministries. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, I just, I mean, to be part of Peacemaker Ministries 30 years was such an incredible privilege, seeing God work in so many ways. Uh, marriages on the brink of divorce, churches headed towards splits, uh, major lawsuits, you know, $200 million lawsuit against a church and denomination resolved uh, in reconciliation, restoration, mm -hmm. confession with attorneys in the room crying and saying there's a power here, what is it? I love that question when an attorney asks mm -hmm. it. So to be part of that for 30 years was just a, a great thrill. But then to be given the privilege of actually taking those principles and moving into a new related but different ministry, how do we get upstream of conflict? How do we prevent those getting up to the edge of the cliff, sometimes going over experiences, and help Christians learn the skills God gives to us to have closer, more intimate relationships with less offense, more empathy, more compassion, they really do show the power of Christ in us. And th there's a real tight connection between the two ministries. Uh, tell us th the threads that unite them. Well, all the principles at Peacemaker dovetail into RW. They're, they're completely compatible uh, ministries. And uh, a lot of the people that we're now training are certified Christian conciliators from Peacemaker. So there's just continue, continual dovetail dovetailing. So when you were offering seminars in peacemaking and traveling all over the country and the world teaching these principles, you, you must have seen something to, to prompt you to go, we need to take a few steps backwards and, and rebuild the groundwork. Did that happen? Yeah. Um, with RW? I mean, when you were in Peacemakers, oh, you Peacemaker. saw the need for RW. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I would come home from mediations, and we might have, uh, there might have been a, a couple headed for a divorce, uh, a church elder team about to dismiss their pastor, church on the brink of a split, two Christian businessmen in a lawsuit. And again and again and again, we would see through the power of the gospel, the wisdom of God's word, people 
turn those things around. Take responsibility. See their sin. Confess their sin. Repent. Forgive. Negotiate godly agreements going forward. And I love seeing it. But I, I would come home and I'd say, Corletta, it was great to see people. They, they got right up to the edge of the cliff and at the last minute, God reconciled them. You know, praise be to his name. And I thought, you know, it'd be really nice if they didn't have to get right up to the, the edge, edge of the of cliff. cliff. Yeah. And so I started saying, what can we do working upstream? Um, just one example, the capacity for empathy. Th- this is a, something programmed into us by God's design, but it is a quality we can either develop we can ignore, or in our culture, in many ways, we stifle it. Mm-hmm. Just think of little boys, when they cry, what's the first thing we say to a little boy when he starts to cry? Oh, big boys don't cry. Be tough. Stuff it. At a young age, we teach men in this country to stuff their emotions. Mm-hmm. They grow up, <laughs> get into adulthood, meet a young lady, they have this romantic relationship, they, they think there's lots of emotional connection there because there's romantic uh, connection. They get married, five years later, they're in with a counselor, and the wife is saying there's no emotional connection because they confuse romance Mm -hmm. with emotional connection. And men often don't know how to read their emotions. They don't know how to communicate their emotions. They don't know how to handle their emotions. They just stuff them. Mm -hmm. And then because of that, they don't know how to read their wives. They, they, They don't read the body language, the tone of voice, the sadness, the joy. And so this, what should be a deeply connected relationship portraying the intimacy of Christ and his church is two people living separate lives. And that's just in marriage. You, you saw marriage. similar things happening in the church mm-hmm. that convince you that somebody's got to do something about this, yeah. right? Yeah, even in churches, one of the things that breaks my heart the most is we have pastors who are well-trained theologically. They've got wonderful skills. They developed understanding of God's word, all of which is vital and crucial for pastoral ministry but they haven't learned how to actually live that out in daily life, uh, connect with people in love, compassion, gentleness, kindness, um, qualities attributed to Christ himself. But those are things they've not learned how to do. So we want to really just help bring church leaders and everyday Christians just to a higher level of those relational skills. In one of your uh, uh, blog pieces on your website, there's this phrase or sentence, a lot of Christian leaders are being abruptly removed from their post these days. Pastors, seminary, seminary presidents, um, uh, ministry CEOs, and the underlying issue is relational wisdom. Uh, just expound on that. The most frightening words a pastor can hear is to see his head deacon or head elder walk into his office on Monday morning and say, uh, Pastor? The elders met yesterday. And any time you hear that your elders or your deacons, whoever your authority group is, met without advance warning, without you, not good. It, it just, your stomach sinks. And I, I have talked to so many church leaders. In fact, who, who gets hurt more is their wives. Um, when, a, when a woman sees her husband, who has labored so hard to serve a church, just attacked, criticized, and then sometimes forced out, it breaks their heart. And I was staying at a, a bed and breakfast one time. A woman came in to clean the room. We started chatting. Her house turns out she was a pastor's wife who'd been removed from his church three years earlier. She and her husband had not been in a church in three years. They were so wounded by how the institutional church handled them that they still believed in God. They still believed in Jesus, but they were very, very skeptical of his body. Mm, mm. So this ministry, RW360, or Relational Wisdom 360, how, how do you hope to address these things? What are you trying to do with this? We're basically trying to help um, Christians, and again, not just church leaders. It goes right down to children. You can start teaching these things to a two-year-old, literally, to a two-year-old, but is to, is to help them see that right there in God's Word is, is a wealth of information on how God made us in in his image. We have the capacity for love, the capacity for relationship, but it has to be developed. And so our ministry is primarily educational. Is we do seminars, we've got a lot of information available online. Um, We do a weekly blog that's just, every Monday morning there's just some principle you can use that week uh, in your relationships. We we work a lot with churches, ministries, Christian-owned businesses, Christian schools, um, just trying to take this information in 
so they can start seeing, wow, God really has a lot to say. And especially to see the relevance of the gospel itself. Mm. Um, you know, many, many Christians are what I would call two-door uh, gospel people. They think of the gospel as two doors. One is a door you come through a conversion to, to come to faith and salvation in Christ. But too often we then sort of think that we, we put the gospel like a plane ticket into our pocket and just walk through the room of life until we get to the second door, which is death. Then we pull the gospel out again and say, oh, I'm about to die. It's all right. I believe in Jesus. I'll be in heaven. But day to day, um, we often forget the relevance. When, when you've discovered that someone in your church has sexually abused children in your nursery for the last three years, that, yes, there's legal issues, there's emotional issues, there's liability issues, but most of all, there's a gospel issue. Where is the gospel in this? Where's the redemption of Christ in this? For the perpetrator, for the victims, for the church itself. It's the gospel. Mm. That's what I've appreciated so much as a pastor when we benefited from peacemakers. It was the gospel was very at the center of this. And that's really what you're trying to do with RW360 yeah. as well. So when, you know, you hear a lot of talk about EQ these days, but what's the difference between an EQ and RQ? <laughs> Um, EQ is a phrase, emotional quotient. It's supposed to be sort of a parallel to intelligence quotient. Intelligence quotient is your ability to learn and assimilate information. So IQ. high IQ people can do that. So EQ is, is um, based on a, a concept called emotional intelligence. It's either EI or EQ. They're synonymous. The concept was first articulated in 1925. Nothing much happened with it for a while. 1985, a man named Dan Goleman wrote a New York Times bestseller called Emotional Intelligence. And what it is, it's basically that in addition to our ability to acquire and utilize just information about the world, mm -hmm. we also have a capacity to read and address emotions, both in ourselves and other people. And so emotional intelligence, the traditional secular model, has four components. One is your ability to read your own emotions. And then secondly, to manage those emotions. And then three is your ability to read the emotions of other people or groups of people and then manage those relationships. And those are four skills you can develop. Uh, corporations around the world now are spending hundreds of millions of dollars teaching these skills. Mm -hmm. Special forces teams, NFL teams. You cannot get into a major business school right now, a graduate school, without being tested for EI and EQ. So it is a big, big business, and there's a lot of valuable training there. What we're doing with RW, or RQ, relational quotient, or relational wisdom, is realizing that as good as the secular model is, by God's common grace, um, there's valuable things there, but it's missing some pretty important things. A doctrine of God. Who, who gave us relationship? Who designed us? A doctrine of man, a doctrine of sin, a doctrine of redemption. There's, there's deep theological issues um, they're sort of like people who've been, who practiced medicine before they discovered viruses and bacteria. They saw the symptoms of disease, but they didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. As Christians, we open the Bible, we understand the cause of relational disease, so to speak. Sin entered the world. It, it has physically corrupted us. Our minds don't work quite the way God designed them. It's a beautiful, beautiful organ, but it's been twisted. Mm -hmm. um, so psychology and human behavior and neurology, they're all off. Um, the Bible tells us, what do we start doing to, to put things back, redeem things? So relational wisdom is a, go a God-centered, gospel-driven, biblically grounded form of EI or EQ, mm -hmm. basically. How do we bring the gospel, bring the wisdom of God, taking the best of the EQ literature, and there's a lot of good stuff out there. What I've learned about the brain, but let me just give you this exhortation. When a pastor steps into a pulpit on Sunday, one of the most important things he's trying to do is to affect the way people think and the way they behave. The way they think and the way they behave. The organ that has the biggest impact on how we think and behave is the human brain, and yet the average pastor hasn't spent five minutes studying the brain. We have an enormous amount of information now on the brain. And I just would encourage you, as future leaders in the church, study the brain. I just re recommend Goleman's book, Emotional Intelligence, too. There's a lot of things in there I would not agree with, but there's a lot of profound insight on how the brain works. And even as you stand in the pulpit on Sunday preaching, 
whether you smile, your smile can have an impact on your audience reception, your tone of voice, and there's communication techniques engaging them. A good friend of mine is actually researching a book now on emotional intelligence and preaching. Mm. So these are qualities and skills we can learn. But you try to center it all in the gospel and in knowing God and, and his word yep. uh, and benefit from what we've learned about EQ. Yep. And John Frame helped you along the way too, didn't he? He did. He did. Uh, we, we you want to say how? I don't know if John, John's, John's right here. there. Yeah. yeah no. Um, in fact, when I was developing this, a number of people called me up and said, did you get this from John Frame? Mm -hmm. um, because what we see is the same thing John has seen, that we, we've got a God who loves triads. He's got a thing for triads. Um, and the whole idea of triperspectivalism, we call our ministry in one way triperspectival wisdom. And it's the idea that relationships are inherently three-dimensional. We're in relationship with God. Whether we realize it or not, uh, even a pagan is in relationship with God, even though he doesn't acknowledge it, because God is giving him his next breath. He's giving him the next beat of his heart. So we're also in relationship with ourselves. Now, some people posit that. Are we really in a relationship with ourselves? You bet you are. There's nobody in the world you're more in a relationship with than yourself. And that's why, just read the Psalms. Why are you so troubled, O oh my soul, so downcast within me? The psalmists are incredibly introspective in a healthy way, not a morbid way, a healthy way. What's going on inside of me? What am I feeling? What do I want? What's controlling me? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What is God's calling in my life? Those are questions we need to answer. And then thirdly, the third part of the triad is other awareness. God calls us to love our neighbors. You know, what do I know about my neighbor? What is, what is her strength, her weakness? What do I know about my wife? Uh, what, what does she like? What is she afraid of? What does she value? How do I minister to her? How do I bless her? How do I see her gifts uh, grow and develop? So that's where the, the triperspectival fits beautifully is just recognizing God designed us to be in relationship with him, with ourselves, and with others. Mm. I remember years ago hearing you preach, and it may have been at my former church, uh, Cherry Creek Presbyterian Church in Denver, Colorado, and you began with the image of a, a bride dressed in this beautiful gown, and, and you, you just built it up so she was radiant, and then uh, she had been standing on the side of the road, and her dress was all soiled and dirty and everything. And you talked about the bride of Christ because of the way we deal with conflict. Um, right now, has a very soiled garment, and we need to do conflict better. Yeah. You've had a passion for the unity of the church. Mm -hmm. and, and this is really, again, an extension of that, helping us get our relationships in order. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. You know, Jesus said, by the love you have for one another, the world will know you're my disciples. Mm -hmm. There's a flip side to that. If we do not love each other, if we do not forbear with each other and forgive each other and, and put up with each other and, and reconcile with each other and work out our differences, the world says, don't talk to us about this God of unity. I see no unity in your life. I see no grace in your life. Mm -hmm. And one of the major, in fact, one of Barna's studies on why people leave the church and are in the church, number one reason people give is the hypocrisy of Christians. We speak of love, but they don't see it in our relationships. Mm -hmm. So it, it's vital. Uh, John, or Jesus also in John 17, he talks about, may they be brought to one, that, they, that we would, in our oneness in the body, would reflect the unity of, of Christ and the Father. And he says to let the world know that God sent him and loves us even as he loves his son. So our, our relationships have a profound effect on the credibility of our witness. I want to open it up for questions. So if you have a question for uh, Ken Sandy, come up to the mic and uh, just line up and you can ask. And as always, I'm loaded for bear so I could go forever, which we're not going to do. But uh, So giving students the opportunity, let me ask you the, the next question. We have... Um, counseling students here, and we have a lot of uh, future pastors. Come up right to the mic. We have a lot of future uh, pastors. Um, but let, let me start with the, let me start with the question, actually. Okay. <laughs> Let's start over here. Yeah. Okay. I missed the first part, so I uh, hope I'm not um, rehashing anything. The Apostle Paul said to become all things to all men. 
My question is, two questions. How do you become all things to all men when it pertains to homosexuals? And the other one is, I live in a low income area, gangs, shootings, killings, mm. arguing, all that. How am I supposed to become all things to those people? Mm. Two, wow. both of those. Yeah. Very, very relevant question. I, I don't think what Paul is saying there is just conform to the world around you. If this person likes this, then you like it. If he likes this or he believes in this, you believe in it. I think what he's talking about there in the context of that passage is to understand where they're coming from. To, to, you don't just condemn a homosexual. You want to engage him. You want to talk to him about his need. He, he's dipping his bucket in a well that will never satisfy him. We have a well that will satisfy. So to understand what the craving, what the desire, what the longing of people is, um, even the, the gang in that initial, and I'm, I'm not an expert in dealing with gangs, but what I do know is that God designed us for three things. We have a need for transcendence, worship, we have a need for community, and we have a need for purpose. And gangs is a, is a distorted way of finding community. Most people are in gangs, they don't have community, they don't have family, they don't have a church, and so they're looking for it somewhere else. So how do we engage them. We know they need community. We go and we engage them. We try to build relationship with them and help them see there is a better community for you than this gang. It is called the, Jesus, the Church of Jesus Christ. Um, and the same thing with the homosexual, whether it's a homosexual or someone who is promiscuous heterosexual, where, wherever there is sexual dysfunction, wherever there's someone who's materialistic or proud or angry, whatever they're wrestling with in their life, the first thing we need to do is understand them to, to see what's going on in their lives, what is the desire that is fueling that, and, and they're trying to gratify those desires in false, inadequate ways and point them to the only one who can satisfy that desire, which is Jesus Christ. Mm. Okay, so, mm. thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's, when I first heard about peacemakers, you know, my, my first uh, inclination was a bit cynical, like, uh, you know, it sounds, it sounds a little soft, a little, I, I had no idea that it was this gospel-based approach of seeing people reconciled by the power of the cross. And then I thought, wow, I need this badly. In fact, our church needs this badly. But, but the resources we have in the gospel are so extraordinary, aren't they? They are. Let me give you a practical example of the gospel, uh, Don, that, that we, we often make it just sort of academic and theological way up in the air, yeah. how practical it is. Um, this is what you need to get, get down to with the gospel of people sometimes. Uh, when our children were little, my wife homeschooled both of our kids. And I call it homeschooling accelerated sanctification for mothers. Um, <laughs> when, when you're with those little sinners 24-7, it'll bring out every sinful tendency. But he, here, you know, there's a lot of days where the, the issue was not academics, it was relational. In fact, Corilla never had a problem with the academics, it was relational. So one day I was homeworking and I heard some conflict in the, in the classroom, went down, listened for a moment. And my daughter, Megan, who was about 12 years old at the time, was clearly the one who was antagonizing her brother, which was upsetting the lesson plan and all this tension. So I called my daughter out of the room. I said, Megan, let's talk. And we went into an adjacent room, and, uh, and we, a room my kids called the dungeon, as you can guess why. And we walked into there. I sat down on the bed. My daughter laid down on the, on the floor with her head up against the nightstand. Her arms were folded. Her body was rigid. You could practically see the force field around her. She, she was ready for the lecture. And this is what we do in the church often. We lecture. We bring God's word as a weapon, as a club to people. And she had the force field up. And I looked down at her, and I realized, you know, I could talk for two hours. It would not penetrate her. So I, I, I said, Megan, if, if Jesus was here right now, what do you think he would say to you? And she didn't even look up at me. She just said, stop controlling your brother. You know, she knew what the issue was, but that was not a repentant statement. Um, it was a defiant statement. And I said, Megan, you know, he probably would get around to that eventually. But before he did that, I think what he would say is this. I think he would say, Megan, I love you. I love you more than you can even begin to imagine. I love you so much that before I even made the world, before the foundation of time, I looked down through time and I saw you and I said, you are mine. And then I brought you into this world at just the right time, and I gave you to this family who adopted you because I knew they would love you and tell you about me because, Megan, I love you so much. I wanted you to know how much I love you. 
and I put you in a church where you heard the gospel and you had Sunday school teachers telling you about me and I gave you gifts and talents and puppies and all sorts of things. Why? Because I love you. But Megan, I also knew you would struggle with sin. You would, you would do things that you wouldn't want to do and you'd feel bad about, but you keep doing them and I just couldn't stand that. And those sins would separate us forever. I couldn't stand it. So 2,000 years ago, Megan, I came down and I went up on a cross and I died for every one of your sins, including the ones you did in the classroom five minutes ago. I paid the price for all of them. And Megan, I love you so much. I also lived a perfect life that I could give you my record. So when you get to heaven, someday you'll say, that's your record. And someday I'm going to come and bring you to be with me. Now, if you've listened to what I said, I just paraphrase the gospel and its implications from Genesis to Revelation. We need to make the gospel relevant and practical and it is so rich and full and all the, all the implications. And as I did that, I watched my daughter laying on the ground, and her body was rigid, and as I kept talking about the grace of God and the love of God and Jesus' love for her, her body just softened, the force field went down. At the end of it, I said, now, honey, this is one thing I want to say. This is Daddy speaking, not Jesus. He says, I love you too, honey. Jesus has put his love for you into my heart, and no matter what you do, I will never stop loving you. At that point, she got up off the ground, came up, laid down with her head on my lap, and just said, Daddy, please pray for me. I just hate it when I do all those things to Jeff. Please pray that Jesus would change my heart. Mm. The law can restrain sin, but the law cannot change the heart. The gospel is what changes the heart. It's what wins the heart. And so, to be, I, I've given that same talk to pastors. I've talked to pastors who've told me they haven't had anyone bring them the gospel in years. You want to bless your pastor this weekend? Go and bring him the gospel, the good news of Jesus' love for him. And that's, that's what we should be doing is ministering this love mm. to people. Mm. So, mm. Um, Again, if you want to come up with uh, questions, please do. But Ken, uh, so we have a real strong counseling program here. Uh, so a lot of counseling students who are going to go in all kinds of counseling uh, ministries in, in the church and outside the church, uh, give a word to them about RW as you understand it from your yeah. ministry. Can I give a word also to theology students? I'm getting there. Yeah. Oh, you're going to yeah. get there. Okay. Yeah. Because they both need a word. Well, get both. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they do. Um, we do. You know, Randy Alcorn's got a great book called The Grace and Truth Paradox. And he talks about the fact that these two qualities, and John says, Jesus came from the Father full of grace and truth. They're, they're two right. powerful qualities in Christ. But as human beings, we, we tend to sort of gravitate toward one or the other. And so what I find, people in counseling ministries, they, they will t often gravitate toward grace, mm -hmm. compassion, mm -hmm. kindness, understanding, and those are gifts you need to be a good mm -hmm. counselor. Mm -hmm. And you know, develop those gifts to their fullest. But don't ever lose sight of this truth, theology, component, that just being compassionate to somebody um, isn't always a thing that's going to solve the issue. Sometimes you have to confront people with the truth about sin, about mm -hmm. repentance, about the consequences, about the nature of God, the promises of God, the character of God. We need to bring them the truth of God as well. But then I would flip the same thing for the theology yeah. students. Um, I think often, especially in reform circles, we emphasize we get a lot of doctrine and theology and we think that just bringing truth to people, if you just get your theology right, it would be okay. And we don't realize God has made us as emotional creatures. Mm -hmm. Emotions are not the result of the fall. <laughs> I want to say again, emotions are not the result of the fall. In many churches, we treat them that way. That somehow before the fall, there weren't emotions. That's not true. We are fundamentally wired for emotion. God describes himself uh, with emotions. Jesus is described with emotions. So those of you that have an, a tendency toward the truth, towards theology and doctrine, understand you need to deliberately develop your capacity to understand the biblical basis for emotions, the neurological basis that God designed, and how we actually channel those emotions, um, especially when sin twists them. You know, jealousy, lust, craving, bitterness, anger, those are twisted emotions. And how do we bring God's word and the gospel to bear on those things? Mm -hmm. So I, I think the theology students and the counseling students can minister to one another and help each other learn and grow. Yeah, and the whole relational part for the, those who are going to be pastors is, is really critical. Uh, you made a comment in chapel 
I think it was something like you've never seen anybody hired uh, or lose their job as a pastor for poor Hebrew skills, but it's always relationships, yeah. you know? Yeah, I've, I've never in my life seen a pastor lose a pulpit because of a lack of technical expertise, whether it's, yeah. you know, uh, languages, Old Testament theology. Now, if someone's really poor in preaching, that will work against him in the long we, run. We want them to be great. <laughs> want to be good preachers. But I've seen people who are great preachers who still lose yeah. a connection with their congregation. Yeah. Um, we need, I, you know, just a little tidbit. I had one of the finest pastors I've ever known tell me, say, Ken, the, the secret to longevity in a church, if you want to be there for a long time, successfully ministering to your people, learn the names of your parishioners' children and regularly ask them by name how their kids are doing. Mm, mm. How did Johnny do in the soccer meet this mm, weekend? How mm. did Linda do in this That's thing? Good. Your people will forgive any number of deficiencies <laughs> if you love their kids. It, it, take one step further. I meet somebody on a walk who pays attention to my dog. I was going to say, and talk to them about their smart dog. Yeah. Right? yeah. No, seriously, when someone likes my dog, I like them. Yeah. Yeah. When someone likes my kids, I like them. It's, we're wired that way. But seriously, connect with your people at a real life issue, at an emotional issue, at a story issue. They will, even if you're not the greatest pastor in the world, they're going to still say, oh, but he loves us. Mm -hmm. He loves us. And I like your dog. It's just that your dog can't sing. So, That's right. You know, That's, right. Just, That's just, right. Okay, so now you tell, you're talking to seminary students. If you could change, um, improve is the best, best way to put this. Uh, there are a lot of great things that happen in seminary and at RTS. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't a huge fan and think this is really important. But if you could tweak it, if you could add to it, um, what are things that you'd say, you know, you got to think about this? Yeah. Well, having done graduate school myself, um, I know the pressure just to master technical information. And you've got, a, you've got a rigorous curriculum here. You've got a lot of valuable, essential knowledge to accumulate and to process and to learn how to do. So I know the pressure to just really study and study and study and learn things is, is great. So the first thing I would just say is, no matter how much you're working academically, don't let it prevent you from quality, relational time with your spouse. Um, spouses put up with a lot for a long time as their spouse goes through yeah, uh, graduate school. So Love your spouse. These are precious years you will not get back. And if you've got kids, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you. You may not get an A in a class. You might get a B because you were spending time with your three-year-old. Um, you will never have her at three years old again. This yeah. is the only time. Yeah. So that's the first thing is love your family. Secondly, is keep asking yourself, how does this principle help me to love God and love my neighbor? <clears throat> keep trying to make it practical and relational, because everything ultimately should be directing us to love God or love our neighbor. Just keep saying, what are the relational implications of this? God is a relational God. There's no God in the history of the world that man has conceived that has portrayed himself in the relational language of the Bible. Father, mother, brother, sister, friend, shepherd, um, with cords of kindness I brought you. I mean, God is telling us again and again, he is a relational God. Enjoy that relationship. Ask him to just saturate with you that it flows out into the lives around you. Mm. So I don't think you need to change the curriculum as much as you need to just continually say, how do I make this truly relational? That's great. Ken, uh, we got to close, but you, you're doing a conference in uh, Orlando this weekend at Lake Baldwin Church. Tell us a little bit about the conference, yeah. and then we're gonna, uh, okay. I'm going to ask you to pray for our students. Great. Um, yeah, we're doing a uh, conference Friday night and Saturday. I know the students here have got very full curriculum, but I would still tell you that, I mean, very full weekend. You probably think I can't afford to take off, but let me just tell you, I think <laughs> this training could really help you deal with some of the stress of seminary some of the stress it puts on marriages. So I, I would say invest in it. Friday night up at Lake Baldwin um, Church, uh, we're gonna do a couple of hours that evening, the next day another three hours, and we're gonna really dig into the relational skills. How do you really develop the ability to know and be led more effectively by God himself? Is, is God really your GPS for life? How do you listen to God, know him, respond to him more? Secondly is how do you really learn how to read your own emotions, manage those emotions, express those emotions, capture the power 
and live them out in a constructive way. And then finally, how do you learn how to read other people? Read their eyes, read their tone of voice, watch their body language, watch how they walk across the room. Are you, are you skilled in reading all the communications people send to you and then responding to them with love? We'll be using a lot of video clips in this, movie clips, so you can actually see these things in action. And of course, all of it we built on a solid theological foundation. Um, I can tell you, invest five hours in some RW training, you will probably save yourself about 100 hours down the road of some conflict that you'll be able to avoid. Mm. So, mm. That's good. And good. you're going to be offering this in different parts of the country as well. We do it all around the country. It's also available online. Okay. Yeah. All right. Ken, thank you for taking time to come to Reform Seminary in Orlando. It's great thank to have you here. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Can I pray? Yeah. I'd I'm going, to, I'm going to pray. Before I pray, I just want to say this. Don't let finances keep you away from the seminar. You can, we, we give full scholarships easily. Just go to the website and just request a scholarship. We'd love to have you there. So let me pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a highly relational God. Mm. You call yourself our Father, and you call us your, your children. Not just your children, your dearly beloved, precious children. And Lord, that is a position you give to us. It is a treasure that we often do not understand or experience as full as we could. So I just mm -hmm. pray everyone here, Lord, would, would find a deeper and deeper understanding of your love for them, your compassion, your kindness, your gentleness, your, your sacrificial moving on our behalf, Lord, sending your own son into this world to die for us, that you would have relationship with us for eternity. And Lord, I pray that we'd be so filled with that realization of your love. We would be so intrigued and inspired by the unity we see in the Trinity itself that it would just flow through us out into our lives, that our marriages would be so beautiful to people, not perfect, but even how we wrestle through our, our struggles and problems would be so evident um, th that we are successful because of Christ that other people would come to us and say, how do you do that? How did you find that kind of marriage relationship? How do you parent like that? And Lord, that you would especially work with the people here in this room who are training for ministry, that you would equip them not only with the solid theological foundation, but Lord, you would help them to see how they can live that out, to love you and to love their neighbor in such a way that many people will be drawn to Christ through their example as well as their teaching. For your glory, for the extending of your kingdom, Lord, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ken. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you.